Hello and welcome to Demo Tapes, a brand new music podcast that's all about pressing rewind and going right back to the start with some of the world's biggest bands. I'm Rick Martin and this, my co-pilot on this trip down memory lane, is Sarah Kemp. Co-pilot? Does that mean I'm below you? Uh, so I was thinking about this in terms of how we describe this, but aren't like co-pilots the same level as the pilot? I was trying to think of something that well, didn't make you basically sound like my side. Exactly, I, I think I basically think you've set the tone wrong here, Rick. I'm more like you're Robin to the Batman or whatever that is. But anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Hi uh, guys. <laughs> thanks for downloading uh, what is essentially the podcast equivalent of our debut album, uh, or in fact, you could call this our own personal demo tape. Nice. Which means that maybe we won't even get to make an actual album if no one decides to listen to this. We think of the mountain of demos that exist out there in, in the world. True, but let's not go into it thinking that anyway. Um, but it's probably not an entirely accidental segue into what this podcast is actually all about. So, on demo tapes, we'll be rewinding back... Yeah, very good. Seat to yeah, it's good, isn't it? ...to some of the biggest bands and scenes of recent decades, digging into our own memories, but also a host of other people's as well. And we'll be including interviews with the bands themselves, along with journos, promoters, fans, and anyone really who was there with a tale to tell. I think, I suppose, when I think about the most exciting time uh, to watch a band or be a fan of a band, uh, it's it's kind of their emergence. It's that that time when they maybe played their first gigs, or you hear their first singles, or indeed their their first demos, which is something we will be going into kind of a lot of detail on this, or maybe even the first interview you read with them in the music press. And I think. The whole point of this podcast, we're going to be kind of shamelessly uh, nostalgic about that real excitement that we felt when we first saw uh, some of the bands and scenes that we loved. And you've hit on a good point there. It's bands and scenes that we we loved and still love today, I think, and also kind of maybe want to learn a bit more about. Um, And the thing is, we're not really going to be criticising. This is not what this podcast is about at all. It's kind of a bit of love um, into into bands and like hearing from other people who have that same love as well. Um, But yeah, I you've chosen to download it so that means we're on the right track to going we to hope, going down yeah. that yeah we hope um so we we hope you'll enjoy joining us on this trip down memory lane uh, so i guess since sarah we've just admitted that this is basically all about us of and course. what we're into <laughs> we should probably introduce ourselves uh, before we kind of get fully stuck into uh this, this week's episode um, but actually, that's probably a bit awkward to introduce yourself. It's like when you join a new class at school. Hi, you stand I'm up Sarah and Kemp. Yeah, say no, this thanks. is me, or when you, or in fact, you're starting a new job and you've got to do the, the dreaded, you know, meeting. Handshake. Yeah, introduce <laughs> Handshake yourself. Everyone. So why don't we start by introducing each other? That's probably slightly less awkward. Uh, slightly less awkward. Okay. Well, yes, this is Rick Martin. Um, he's from Manchester. <laughs> I think I've got my accent pretty much down there. Um, Rick was an enemy journalist for ten years, and um, that's kind of, I think, why we became good friends actually uh i call him the rain man of music trivia he's got an insane memory and he's a bit of a fact hunter um loves it take him to a pub quiz and you know you're going to win basically um and yeah we've we've known each other for a couple of years and we realized just by stories of of kind of music really that we've we were probably in the same places for a lot of times when we were a bit younger probably might have hated each other because of kind of what we were yeah i think it's interesting this is this is sarah kemp and i'll come on to what she is in a minute but um i think when i think about when I was a journo and, and some of the stories Sarah tells me, probably the best way to describe it is I was the kid in Almost Famous because I, I did write for the enemy from a ridiculously young age, 15, 16, whatever, like the guy in Almost Famous. And Sarah was more like the Penny Lane <laughs> going in with the band backstage while I'm kind of left at the, the stage door. Probably not quite like that, but that's <laughs> kind of the best I probably did actually like I, I go no, no at you at some point because you were probably trying to scramble backstage and I had the backstage pass from it. Well, exactly <laughs> that. And I think, you know, if you want to know what actually happened to, to Penny Lane when, when, when she grew up and moved on from hanging around with Stillwater, Penny Lane became a blogger and a bit of a blagger, and that's what Sarah is. So Sarah uh, writes for her own blog, Life's Loves. Uh, so go and check that out if you want to kind of know a bit more of the, the, the background of Sarah, and I'm sure elements of, of that blogging will, will come into this. So that's us. Awkward introductions out of the way. So this week... Our very first episode of Demo Tapes. I'm pretty excited about this. Um, As I think you're pretty excited about this one because it's, I think it's the first ever kind of story we talked about in terms of music. Um, And I think this is when we started to really realise how we probably were at the same places at the same time experiencing the same incredible things. Um, So we couldn't think of a much better place to start than to kick off with probably the biggest British band of this millennium 
if not ever really um, Arctic Monkeys probably a bit of a stretch ever uh, but, it's a bit yeah. of a stretch but you know but, but they are up there you know who, who else can you think of really the, you know the Beatles the Stones. Um, the Stones yeah but they're they're old they're, they were around a long long time ago this band is new it, it, it emerged at the time when we were kind of around no other band has done that so I guess we need to tell you why we've chosen them. Um, Rick's got a good history with them. That'll come a bit later. And and I've got some good memories of the time. Mostly the fact that I really regret not going to see them when I should have done. When some of my best friends, they were at university and I was a student at college at Nottingham. And um, they, they cottoned on to them really, really, really early. And used to go and see them all the time. But because I didn't like the name, I never actually went. And I actually used to go and <laughs> prefer to go and see... Other bands like such as Ten Thousand Things or the Others or the Paddingtons in favour of the Arctic Monkeys simply because I didn't like the name, even though my friends were telling me that they were the best band. And actually, the, these guys that I knew were were such good fans of theirs. Like they used to get, they used to just call Alex Turner and ask them for guest lists. And actually, they were such good fans that they ended up as as a thank you on their very first album. So can you imagine how? bad I feel for that. like I, I wish I'd have done it anyway but um well, it's funny you mentioned about they're not going to see them we'll come on to this a little bit later but that's one of the shared things we have in that it took me a while to go and see them as well but I guess we'll kind of come on to that a little bit later I think what's exciting about this for me as well is um and I guess I hope exciting for you guys listening as well is We've got some interview footage from the very early days with Arctic Monkeys, so I was lucky enough to do their first interview for The Enemy when they were uh, but teenagers like me. Um, And a little bit later on the podcast, we will be playing um, some snippets of that audio. It is pretty amazing, actually. I I can't believe that we've got... We've actually got our hands on the very first interview that Enemy ever did with the Arctic Monkeys. I can barely believe I still got it. So I remember when we first conceived this idea for this podcast, I went into my... There's a kind of box in one of my cupboards at home that's got uh, copies of all my kind of interv- interview dictaphone tapes, but a lot of the time I taped over them. No, I can't believe I, you've still got... What, what compelled you to keep this one? I don't know. I think I did label it as Arctic Monkeys Raider Enemy feature, but like I say, at the time, I did so many interviews that I... I didn't often like, because I was a student of a lot of money, I didn't often have the money to go and buy more tapes, so I just just tape over it. So it's only recent weeks I realised I I kind of even had this. You've got it. And because this is such a big topic, um, it's definitely a big topic of conversation for us, and they're one of the biggest bands, so I'm sure you guys are going to be interested as well. We're actually going to do a side A and a side B. So side A is now, um, and then I guess you stay tuned for next week um, where we'll release side B, um, where we'll have more interview footage as well. So let's kick off. Um, to talk about the emergence of the band, Rick, like I know you went to Sheffield University, so it would be it'd be really good to hear kind of your very first moments with the band and how kind of small the gig venues were, what the vibe was in there, um, how many times you saw them, how long did it take you to first see them, kind of all that kind of stuff. It would be really good to hear about that. So, yeah, it's funny you say that um, because, as you mentioned before, It took me a while to go and see them. So I started university in September 2004. uh, And I remember on one of my first nights out at university, we lived in an area called Broomhill. And there were some pubs in Broomhill. There's a pub called The York that was Pound a Pint. So we used to go there. And there was a Fox and Duck a bit further up the road. Oh, what happened to Pound a Pint night? Yeah, you can't believe it. Well, I think it's called called Weatherspoons, isn't it? Um, And I remember one of my university housemates, um, who I subsequently fell out with, so I'm not going to name check him. He's not getting a name check here. But one of his friends from home, uh, Joe Williamson, I remember the name of him, um, he'd heard through my housemate that I wrote for the NME, and I suppose as quite a precocious 18-year-old, I didn't exactly make a secret of this. When I was at university, I did trade off it a little bit, I'm happy to admit. Uh, Yeah, I would have done. Well, yeah, I mean, why not? That's what, yeah. I, I was, that's what I wanted to be. That's what I wanted to do. I would have traded off that. We'll come on to that later. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, he said, you're that guy that writes for NME. You need to go and see this band called Arctic Monkeys. They're a local band. Everyone's kind of talking about them. And I thought, A, I don't trust your musical judgment because I don't know you. <laughs> and, B, uh, that's a terrible name. And, in fact, it took me from... So that was September. It was actually March 2005 before I did go and see them you know I kept but I kept hearing this name I kept reading local fanzines and seeing this name Arctic Monkeys even getting me to that first gig wasn't kind of as as straightforward as you might think so I remember being in the Lake District in around kind of February 2005 and I got this phone call from a PR I knew quite a a well-known PR a guy called Anton Brooks who 
was friends with Kurt Cobain, did all Nirvana's early press, and, um, did press for Beastie Boys, kind of one of the heavyweights of the PR world. And that, that kind of made me sit up and take notice and think, well, there's quite a big PR here who's looking after this unsigned band that everyone keeps talking about. And he rang me up and said, would you like to come down and see the band the playing at Sheffield's Harley, which is a... It was kind of like our late night pub in Sheffield. It was one of the pubs that stayed open. The latest, it was right sort of on the corner of the student union, but it wasn't part of the student union. And the pints were a little bit more expensive. They were more like three quid than than, well, than maybe the two quid next nice, door. It? It's where you'd end up at the end of the night. <laughs> and he said they're playing in a couple of weeks. Will you come down? Um, maybe write a review. So I got in touch with my editor at NME and the live desk and said, "Going to see Arctic Monkeys. Uh, everyone's talking about it in Sheffield. Can we do um, a a live review?" And I think when I went and saw them. I, I kind of the penny dropped and I thought God why have I why has it taken me six months now keep in mind at this point the band was still unsigned you know I hadn't missed the train to the point that they'd signed a record deal or anything like that mm. but but you know you missed it enough for you to be a bit peeved to right? be a bit peeved that I could have been there in, yeah. in September 2004 and it had taken me till kind of March oh, tell me about it 2005 <laughs> it was free in so the place was absolutely rammed um, I was on the guest list for a free gig which is a bit odd but probably made sure I made got sure in made sure you got in yeah um, they shut the doors way before the gig started and people were watching um, through the windows wow. um, and you said it's a tiny venue as well, didn't you? It's like less than a hundred. Oh, people. less less than easily less than a hundred. Wow! You're talking. I mean, that's amazing. Just a small pub with a with a stage that wasn't even raised. It was just the corner of the room. And a so band with that raised. energy, like how how did it? What was it like? Um, and I'll say energy was probably the key word. Um, the sound wasn't great in there. You know, anyone that went to that gig that claims that they heard a, they heard a great band <laughs> would be lying. But you could tell there was something there was something about them it kind of immediately that was that was different. I think it was that energy for one personality definitely came through. The Alex's lyrics, although you couldn't really hear them on the night, you had to kind of go and go and listen afterwards. Brilliant! Oh my god, it sounds amazing. So you were there with some friends, and uh, what happened afterwards? Did you get to meet them? Um, so it's one of those gigs where there wasn't really a backstage. There was barely even a stage, you know, it was the corner of a room. Um, the gig ended pretty chaotically, I think fans kind of spilled onto the stage area. Uh, but eventually I did I did catch Alex uh, at the bar afterwards, um, and he was just kind of really sort of thankful and pleased that an enemy journalist had, had come down uh, to rev- to review review the band, and I I remember he was getting mobbed as he was talking to me. <laughs> but he was. So I just kind of said, Alex, you know, it's your night here. Just go and you know, don't don't bother about talking to me. We can do that another time. So do you think just he wanted and... to like, have an interview with you or something? Is that is that what do you think he was angling for? No, or do you I'd, think I'd, he I'd... was just kind of like really excited that someone was there and taking it was finally happening for them yeah I think he was excited maybe that the band were getting national recognition where they'd kind of been a local band to that point but um, I think he was just excited because it was just a very energetic um, sort of gig you know it was just one of those where like I said people were spilling out of the venue people were looking in through the windows so how about the the next kind of gigs that you went to Um, did you did you get in touch with him before you went or did you just kind of go along and, and, and see if you could see them there and then did you get to meet them again like what tell us tell us what happened from that so i guess uh after the gig and i'm trying to piece this jigsaw back together as, as <laughs> it was a, a long this, time ago this podcast so uh, the manager was keen that i heard some of the demos now if i'd have been keeping my ear to the ground anyway they were handing out demo cds at the gigs at the time that's kind of famously what happened with them and that's how their songs ended up on the internet and we'll kind of cover that a little bit later on but um i remember their manager a couple of weeks later or maybe a couple of days later uh, dropped the demos off at my flat to make sure that I had something to listen to when I was was writing the review. Um, and then I guess from there on in, they played fairly regularly in Sheffield. Um, so it was a case of watching them every time they kind of played live locally. So I remember they supported the Coral a couple of weeks later nice. uh, at the Lead Mill. Um, and it was kind of interesting to see them on a, a bigger stage in a bigger venue. Maybe Were not they as ne- good? Yeah, because that's the thing. That, that, was that, there, was that, that energy and kind of excitement in the same... Because I've been to the Lead Mill, and I've been a few times to the Lead Mill. It's a lot bigger than what you've... I haven't been to the Harley, but definitely been to the Lead Mill, and it's a lot bigger than you... Well, it wasn't... The thing is, it wasn't their own gig. Right. So it wasn't like they had a, a crowd who knew all the words. I'd say, actually, a portion of them did. And I think, for me, that gig was more about... You know, you could hear the songs better at the Lead Mill compared to mm. the Harley, and that was maybe where the penny dropped for me of... Of you know, wow, there is some real quality in this. That you know, Alex's lyrics. There's there's something, um, there's something different about this band. I think. I think yep. that that was when the penny really started to drop for me. Mm. And then, kind of beyond that, they played quite a famous gig at Sheffield's Boardwalk, which is now a sadly closed venue. A lot of the kind of the early press shots of them were outside uh, the Boardwalk, and it was a, 
I'm trying to th think how I would describe this venue. It was kind of long and thin. So the stage wasn't particularly wide, but you could there was kind of a depth to the venue, so you could you could definitely fit more in than you could at the the Harley. Maybe not quite as many um, as as you could at, at the Leadmill. So how many times do you think you saw them right in their very very early days before you know before you kind of built a rapport and a relationship with them in terms of probably probably you know. three or four three or four times um, because these were kind of the early gigs before they even, they'd even they'd even put a tour on. So the tour came in May, and we'll talk about that in a minute. These were just the early kind of um, the kind of local gigs. What is important to say about the, the boardwalk actually as well is I remember seeing a quote from Alex. I say seeing a quote from Alex. I think it's a quote he gave me in the interview we're talking about later. And he said that was the first time he'd seen the fans really singing the words back at him and it had kind of blown him away that, that fans it. were yeah. learning the words and singing them back. Um, Imagine what that must feel like as a band. I mean, I don't know if about you, but I've never been in a band, but it's always been a bit of a dream of mine to stand on stage and have people doing exactly what you said, like singing, singing your words back to you and enjoying it and having massive amounts of fun. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? And I think that that's, for me, why they took off in the way they did. I think people really... And I put this to them in the interview a few weeks later, that this is people really started to connect with them on a kind of a level because the songs were social commentaries. And I feel like, at times, they were holding up a mirror to the people who were coming to see them almost. When we were first talking about the Arctic Monkeys, the story that I absolutely loved was the fact that they, they picked you up from your student house in Sheffield and took you to Nottingham, which is where I'm from, um, to see one of their gigs there. What on earth was that all about? And that wasn't even an interview. That was just, just what was it for? <laughs> Hanging out, I guess. Um, you know, by this point, I'd met them at a few gigs, and I wouldn't say I knew them. I've never said at any point in this that I've known the Arctic Monkeys, but we're definitely kind of aware of each other. And yeah, the manager just said to me one day, um, you know, we're starting out, we're kicking off our, our first UK tour, we're doing a date in Nottingham. Um, where, want... where in Nottingham was it? It was at the Social. Oh my God, T another tiny venue. Tiny venue, really yeah. Tiny venue. Um, and I guess this trip to Nottingham was kind of the beginning and the end of my association with the Arctic Monkeys as I was to kind of find out in kind of subsequent months uh, and kind of years. So, yeah, they picked me up from my student flat, uh, which I always quite liked just in terms of showing off in front of my mates. <laughs> yeah, I'm going on a tour bus. Was it a proper tour bus or was it just it was the a minivan? Van. What's a splitter van? So a splitter van is one of those where you kind of have seats in it and then a bit of the back for the gear. Right, so yeah, okay. kind of bigger than a transit van. Yeah. Almost like a minibus, I guess, yeah, but yeah, like yeah. a minibus that's got room for... For gear in it. What uh, happened on the bus? Was it like you know? Was everyone having, um, drinking? So, or like yeah, singing? drinking, uh, smoking. Out of campfire. <laughs> uh, and they had a get. They had a they had a PlayStation on there, or an Xbox. I think it was a PlayStation. Okay. And FIFA. So. Oh, this uh, is my favourite story. This is my fa everyone. This is my favourite Rick Martin story of the Arctic Monkeys. So we were driving like... <laughs> down the M1 to Nottingham, playing uh, FIFA. And at the time, I guess, you know, when you're a student, probably fifty percent of your time. Well, certainly in our house, 50% of our time was spent playing FIFA, if not going out, and maybe 10% was going to lectures. So I was pretty well practised at, uh, at FIFA. And uh, so we're playing it on the way to the gig. Obviously, when you get to the, the venue, the, they have to unload the gear. So uh, they were unloading the gear. I offered to help. I think I maybe carried a couple of cymbals for them or whatever. And then I thought, you know, given that we're mates now, given that we're pals, given that we're bantering, wouldn't it be hilarious to go back on the bus unpause the game we currently had because I think we had quite a serious <laughs> tournament going on while we were there and just change the score in the way that anyone would in a student house right where your mate goes to the toilet or whatever you unpause it you stick a couple in the back of the net you pause it back as if nothing's happened so I did this and then you know didn't think anything more of it but you know the gig happened went to watch the gig drove back with the band back to uh, Sheffield I remember being dropped off um, outside of kind of one of our student pubs and just kind of and slipping you, back into university life. And did, and did you keep playing the game on the way back? Yeah, we, keep, we kept playing, playing on the way the back. Game, so okay. I, so little did I know at the time quite what uh, maybe a catastrophic error I'd made in uh, in changing the score. <laughs> you never do a, a prank again, will you? Because what ultimately came of this, and obviously you'll be hearing the interview, um, you know, a little bit later on in the podcast, but they basically refused to be interviewed by me ever again. What? So you haven't you hadn't interviewed them at this point. This is what I'm confused about. But yet they blacklisted you from ever interviewing them again. What? What are you talking about? Right. So I'm going to explain this now. So what happened was the interview for the for the enemy feature that we're going to hear later on in the podcast came a couple of days after this um, after this oh, incident. I see. Right now, after I'd submitted that interview and then kind of in subsequent months, 
I got the word from my editor and me that the band don't ever want to be interviewed by you again. And <laughs> at the time, I actually didn't find out why. It was as if they closed ranks or at the time I kind of felt maybe the manager thought you don't really want a journalist yeah, yeah, hanging around with the band close, yeah. and it's only if like a few years later maybe six maybe six years later enemy published a feature that was kind of going back over Arctic Monkeys moments and they said and the quote was something along the lines of you you wrecked our game of FIFA and we never trusted you again and it was only six years later picking up that enemy and reading about the incident again that's I, how you know the the, oh the penny God. dropped and it was like oh yeah that was because I unpaused their game of, of FIFA at the time I had no idea at the time it was a bit of a mystery to I me I mean it's actually quite hilarious but don't you think it's a bit pathetic on their part <laughs> sorry if you're listening guys not that they not that they will but I mean come on you're you're just a kid they you're just all kids you play a computer game you know the, the, they blacklisted you for, for, for GTA. but I I've always seen this They're as a bit of like, like an apt metaphor how my career's kind of gone anyway. In okay. The, I've always had this kind of juvenile side, and that was that was the moment where you know if I just managed to keep the juvenile side in a box, then I probably would have had access to the Arctic Monkeys for the rest of their career. But to me, if I find something funny, I'm happy to do it or say it, even if I'm the only one laughing. And at the time, I thought it was very funny to wreck this this tournament, this FIFA tournament we're having, change the score, see if they notice, blame it on someone else. I probably on the I probably on the way back, I blamed someone else in the van and said it was the guy driving the van. Oh, imagine if that had happened, then that would have been even worse. I want, I want to know how they found out. I really want to know. We'll probably never we'll, know. We'll probably never know. Well, you never, you never know. We might meet them again. I might meet them. You might meet them. They might, they might speak to you. They, they might speak to me. Speak oh, I don't know. I don't know if I dare speak to them about knowing them, knowing that I'm friends with Rick Martin. <laughs> they probably <laughs> wouldn't touch me with a barge pole. Uh, cool. All right. Well. That should probably lead us on to the story of the actual interview that you're about to hear. So go on, Rick. You, I mean, you're probably best place to talk about this because you're the one that did it. So yeah, I guess a couple of days after the uh, the trip to Nottingham, the eventful uh, trip to Nottingham, we had an enemy feature interview penciled in. I guess I want to give a little bit of background on how even that came about before we even really kick into the story of, of the interview and obviously the footage. So the first review of the band was published in the enemy in kind of March 2005. And the way it worked in the enemy at the time was, you know, bands would get like their first live review. That was usually, as has kind of been the case throughout the kind of 60 years that the enemy was around, that was kind of the first way that a band got into the enemy was getting a live review. The next step, we want to do a feature interview. You know, we want to do a feature. At the time, that was called Radar. So Radar was the new band section of enemy. So every week there would be a new band kind of featured in that that was enemy pinning its kind of badge on it and saying this is a great new band that that we love. Um, and I'd been banging on from the March, the first gig I'd seen them, all the way up to May, so two months, that we really should be featuring Arctic Monkeys, we really should be doing an interview with them, even though they weren't signed at this point. And when we did run the interview, they weren't signed, they hadn't signed a record deal, they'd barely put any music out. And, you know, kind of beyond that as well, you know, Enemy at the time was a very competitive environment, as I'm sure you can you can imagine. Mm. And I wasn't the only one throwing my hat in the ring to, to do this interview. So I would be regularly ringing up um, Chrissy Morrison, who was the new band's editor of Enemy at the time, saying, no, I really want to do this interview. You know, if anyone else is asking to do it, they shouldn't. Don't let them. <laughs> I'm from Sheffield. You know, I'm, I live in Sheffield at the moment. I've I know the band. I've been hanging around with you. Yeah, yeah, I've been yeah. playing FIFA with them on the tour bus, oh you know. Oh, my God. Um, you know, so really kind of selling the fact that, I guess, because at the time I was, to set the scene a little bit, you know, I was 19, I was in my first year at uni, um, I had not done any kind of interview stuff for Enemy before, a lot of people who came to Enemy maybe had written interviews for fanzines or something like that, I was still learning on my journalism uh, degree course how to do an interview. So, you know, really it was a bit of a gamble on their part. Didn't to to learn how to do an interview. <laughs> oh, I think I think I think you do. I think I think I'm proof of that in, in the footage yeah, about I'm, here I'm, later. Yeah, I'm joking. So there was a real kind of journey to even get to the point where I could um kind of be picked to do the interview, but eventually got the commission, um, and then arranged it with their their PR, so Anton Brooks, the guy who spoke to me originally to say come and see us live. Um arranged the interview with them and it was at their rehearsal space in Neeps End, which if anyone knows in Sheffield, quite an industrial kind of district of the city. You kind of um, leave the city centre and then it's kind of a maybe half a mile kind of south of the, the city centre. It's it, as as one of their songs, so as the sun, when the sun goes down, which is their second number one, is about that area of Sheffield. So when they say over the river going out of town, that's where Neeps End is. And, when the, and obviously, when so the sun. So did you see 
Did you go over the river and out of town? Did yeah. you actually notice you were going over the river yes, and out of town along going, the way? So, oh, okay. uh, and obviously, if you know the song, the song's about yeah. local prostitutes. Yep. And that is also the very true. Of, uh, it's a red light district. Yeah. I see. So, yeah, the interview Did you happened, see any in the studio? Uh, well, well, they weren't in the studio, but no. they were probably probably outside. Yeah. Oh. Um, so, so I wonder whether they kind of, you know, entertained, give them a cup of tea, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> giving them a beer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think those services were on offer, to be honest. Um, so it happened at their um, their their, um, their rehearsal space in 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 Neepsend, a uh, place they called Uncle Rodney's. Kind of curiously, that was what they called. Uh, their rehearsal space and um, so I guess kind of the main memories I have of that day are of getting down there kind of late in the day because I remember they were listening to Steve Lamack on Radio 1 at the time and mm. their their single was actually played on no Steve way. Lamack while I was in while you were there and they were all kind of sat so you around could see, yeah see their reaction what was the reaction was it like uh, excited yeah, teenage kind of, boys yeah it was exciting sat around teenage the radio, boys like, oh my god we're actually on Steve Lamack's show hearing themselves on the radio so wow. that was that was interesting um in the enemy kind of feature interview, there was a photo that went with it, and um, if you haven't seen it, Google it, or we'll put it on the social media every if, you, if you, people want to see this. But it's basically a shot of them playing live. Alex is in a pink uh, polo shirt, and I remember that the for that photo shoot, they kind of insisted that they actually wanted to play live rather than just posing with their instruments. They they wanted to play. I think it was Fake Tales of San Francisco or. Dan- I bet that don't know the dance floor. My memory isn't so good that I, I'm not so Rain Man that I can remember exactly <laughs> which song it was. But they took ages to get the sound right. I've never understood this. Because you're there, I know you, we've talked about this before, and, and you say, I don't really understand it because it's a photo shoot, right? But maybe to them, you know, you're there, you're an enemy journalist, they, they are at the beginning of their career, they want to get this right. Because imagine if you'd have just written in the, you know, in the feature, oh, you know, they... they they did it and they sounded shit. You know, well, you you know what would have happened then? So they were they were obviously perfectionists. Like they were they were professionals at, from a very very young age and a very very starting point in their career. So that's probably why. And it's it's quite interesting to hear that. And I bet you know it's quite interesting for probably Arctic Monkeys fans to hear that as well because they don't get to see the behind the scenes of those interviews. I think perfectionist is probably what it's probably a good a description of of what that that kind of side that that showed in them. Um, I think quite shy is what I would say as well. So the photographer enemy, a guy called Dean Chalkley, quite a sort of celebrated uh, music photographer, um, he wanted to do portrait shots of them as well. He kind of had this idea of doing like a main band shot. And I guess photographers, they want to get stuff that maybe doesn't get used in the, the piece, but they have for kind of their portfolio or for selling back to the record label and all that sort of stuff. And not all the band agreed to have their photo taken. So Alex did, Matt Helders did, Andy Nicholson. But Jamie Cook, guitarist, actually flat refused to have his portrait photo taken and, and kind of barely spoke to me um, sort of throughout the whole the whole few hours that I was down at the, the rehearsal space. Is he still, do you, do you think he's carried that through to the present day? Like, I, to be honest, I rarely hear about that guy. I never see photos of him. He's, he's anonymous, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I, and I've said this in reviews often that he's, I think he's a, a big musical force in that band. Like, if you think about the way their sound changed around Humbug uh, when they kind of went from doing kind of spiky indie rock to, to Queens of the Stone Age style stuff, which, no surprise, because they worked with Josh Hum. A lot of that was from him being a big fan of that kind of stoner mm. kind of grunge rock um, yeah, yeah, yeah. so he's kind of quite he's quite a quiet influence i've always wondered for example when arctics play 505 and miles kane strolls on and does the <laughs> guitar line for that a bit like a kind of football sub coming on at the end and scoring the winner what jamie cook thinks of that when it's like yeah. oh here's, here's alex's like... best mate he's at his real best mate coming on to play kind of the key guitar line in the end at the end of the set so Ooh. he's an interesting character jamie <laughs> cook and maybe we'll Return to that a little bit. A yeah, little bit, and I'd be interested to hear. It. I, I'd never really thought about um, that actually, but I, I think there's another bland, band that does that. It's like Coldplay, and I think I, I was having a conversation with someone a few years ago. If you can name, you, can, you can't name all of the Coldplay members, and they are arguably one of the biggest World bands Champion, in the world. Guy Berryman. Yeah, but you can because you, uh, you know. But, who's the other one? Yeah. World Champion Guy, but obviously Chris Martin. Obviously Chris Martin. Who's the other guy in Coldplay? There's there's one. There's one in the band. Guy Berryman's the, the guitarist. 
then they put, and they, they like to keep it that way. And I think it's a very smart way of doing it because You're right, you, you can have me. all is, of the glory. Who is the fourth uh, member of Coldplay? I've stumped Coldplay. Rick. This is brilliant. This is really bad. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not really bad, but that's that's the point. There are certain bands that you just don't, you know, they don't want to be part of it almost. Like they want to do, they're there for the music, but they don't really care about the fame and the. Well, they probably care about the fortune. But um, anyway, yeah, we digress. So we talked about the fact that you're in their rehearsal studio. I think that's probably a stretch called a rehearsal studio. It's 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 a it's room. an industrial real unit you know in, in the red light district yeah yeah i love the fact that you, you need to put the red light district fact in there um but yeah t- i mean tell me about the actual interview i want to know about what actually happened during the interview so i guess it's an interesting one in, in the sense that this band that had kind of been um so open and uh, and, f- and i guess friendly and 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 kind of welcoming in the kind of weeks leading up to this suddenly quite difficult once the uh, the interview tape was turned on and we were doing an interview they were really difficult kind of in what way I- I- elusive um struggled to answer you know a lot of the questions um do you think they were just scared of saying the wrong thing i think do possibly think someone, do you think someone had tried to give them a bit of media training by this point and they were probably a bit like no, i'm not really sure what i can say or what i can't say and as you said actually being a perfectionist do you think they they want their image to come across as being perfect as well, and that's not always the case when you're interviewing people. I think there's just definitely be a bit of a blabbermouth, can't you? <laughs> definitely an element of that, I think. Um, and 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 yeah, just that they they seem to close up a little bit. I mean, as you'll hear in the interviews, we're we're about to play. We've been teasing this throughout the mm. podcast. Um, they didn't say nothing. Is that, is that a double negative? They didn't say nothing. I don't know. I think they, you can say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They weren't. Uh, <laughs> you know, they 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 didn't have any. They weren't too quiet. They weren't too quiet, but they certainly were not the characters that that I'd kind of get got to know in the kind of the weeks previous. And do you think that they're the characters that have probably been portrayed since? Yes, and I think I, I only saw the. This to me was the beginning stages of some of the things you started to see in. Yeah, because they're quite well interviews. renowned for being hard to interview, aren't they? You know, they're, you, they're difficult. Very, very difficult yeah. to interview. But yeah, okay, interesting. Well, should we should we crack on and listen to it then? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so I guess. Um, I guess a few things to say before we go straight into this would be the quality we accept isn't great on this. <laughs> uh, you have to remember this was recorded on a dodgy tape player bought probably for about 10 quid from Argos at the time we have digitized it we have tried to clean it up a little bit and we are going to upload this uh interview up onto youtube with subtitles so if you really are struggling with with uh, with hearing kind of exactly what they're saying then we'll, we can direct it to that but actually i think you'll get the essence it's one of those you do and yes it's one of those things that, you know i've i've listened to it rick did the interview so he probably his memory is a bit better and he can form a few words better than I could but there are there are a few words missing but that's fine you know we don't you don't need to hear every single word my favorite bit of it is actually hearing the um a couple of times hearing the mobile phone signal just about to go off and someone's about to get a text message <laughs> that's got probably one of my key takeaways from it I think Matt was um, getting calls from a girl during the interview and he kept it? saying I, I don't want to be not accepting this call oh interesting but anyway yeah let's do it yeah so without further ado this is Alex and Matt uh, from the Arctic Monkeys, their first interview recorded 2005 when they were both kind of 19, 20 years old, still an unsigned band. Uh, yeah, and we hope that you're kind of as excited as we are to hear this. Well, first, I kind of want to go through how you kind of formed and how you met and forget all the main details down where you're all from. Okay. Uh, so when, did, when did you all sort of meet? meet at school? Yeah. Me, Al, and Andy. Me, uh, Went to secondary school together. I went to primary school with Alan. We were together basically. And we lived in Elsby, which is not far from mine. And yeah, but we ended up, yeah. And yeah, that's where the batteries ran out on my dictaphone. Oh my god, how awful was that? Do you know what? I I can kind of. I'm not surprised that that happened to you, but actually, knowing you, I, I can't believe that you let that happen. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I mean, nor can I. All the build-up to this interview, the fact that I travelled with them down to their rehearsal space, we'd done oh all the photos, God. 
and then uh, thir- literally 30 seconds into the interview, the, the dictaphone runs out. So what happens next? <laughs> um, there's talk of maybe recording the interview by pen, so maybe trying a bit of shorthand. Oh, no. and did, you, did, you know, did you know or do you know shorthand at that I point? I should have done, because I was going to university and shorthand was part of the course. The problem was the shorthand lessons were always at nine in the morning, and I never <laughs> actually got a hang- hangover. And I was on a hangover, so I never went in. So. And if you did end up going in, then So we had no, to pass 40 words a minute to get our, our shorthand qualification at uni, and I just about scraped that. Oh, my God. So great. shorthand was out of the question. So what did we do? I had to... And we're obviously in the middle of nowhere. So this is in the middle of an industrial estate. It's not like we're doing this in the boardwalk and there's a Tesco Express across the road. And this is before and mobile phones with record, audio exactly. recording. Exactly. None so of that. None so of I had that. nothing to back me up on that. So basically we had to send out their, um, their PR, Anton Brooks, to go and get some batteries for me, which is probably... One of the most excruciating half hours of my life. So I oh remember they had, a, they had a pool table in there and we were playing games of pool. But I'm kind of stood there going, I'm really sorry, guys. I know you want to get on with this, but, um, <laughs> but we can't, can't do it. And can't. then also, you don't really want to have a conversation with them because it might ruin sort of the conversation you want to have with them a bit later on. So, so, so you know, I, I, of... I wondered why they never want to be interviewed by me again. I've I mean, got a now, question. Now we know why. Did you cheat at pool? <laughs> <laughs> I probably should have done, to be honest. I mean, I had nothing to lose at that point. I wasn't very good at pool, so, yeah, I probably should have done. Um, so, yeah, eventually batteries were sourced, dictaphone was, was powered up again, um, and we started again. Uh, so this is take two take of two. Arctic Monkey's uh, first ever enemy interview. So here's Alex and Matt. What are you the band from, then? Yeah, So the second bit, you know, they they seemed pretty laddy, and I think I think they've always been one of those bands that just they're just lads um, and quite lovable little rogues as well. I think that's probably why I was quite first attracted to them, as well as the music, just kind of their their personalities and their character, and just being, you know. At the time, teenagers who just used to sit on corners and drink cans of cider and go to the go to the offie and and get drunk. And that's on a not the side out. that they they tried to hide. If you listen to that uh, portion of the interview, there they're talking about how you know they got to know each other as friends through drinking white lightning, or they called it white magic. Apparently, a cheaper version of, oh, of it's the like cider. ninety nine p or something. Ninety nine p cider contains sulfites. On, I remember seeing. I, mean, I know all alcohol contains sulfites, but there was once I, I was as a student, I looked at that and I was just burst into laughter, being like, "Oh my god, what are we putting in our body?" It's ninety nine p cider, but yeah, they used to do they used to do that. But that's co- that's cool to hear them kind of say that. And also another thing I, I really liked about this is that Alex is really kind of emotive talking about the first time he picks up an instrument and you know learning to play a Bond song. Which if you're a band, if you're a, if you're any kind of band, and and you're into that kind of industry, you're gonna want to be you're gonna want to play the Bond song, aren't you? It's really cool, and you can kind of tell that even now. Maybe not so much in the early in the early days, but even now they've kind of you know Alex Turner's become almost like a bit of a, a version of James Bond himself, hasn't he? Kind of like hmm. really cool. That's probably a stretch. <laughs> but no, but he has like you know he's he just like oozes. He's the coolest rock star at the at the moment by a long way, and I think James Bond is one of the coolest film stars still. 
I, I think I think you probably you'd probably divide opinion on saying that. I think I think for a lot of people. <laughs> Come on, of, everyone! I'm going to get abuse for saying that now. Well, it, I like, think he probably yeah. lost a little bit of that cool when he dropped the microphone at the Brits and said, "Bill, you know, uh, bill me for the microphone." And that rock and roll speech. Everyone I speak to about yeah. Alex Turner now, they go, "Oh, oh that dear. that that rock and roll," <laughs> you know. But we could probably again. Oh, we're skipping way far ahead there. Yeah. This, this is this is the 19 year old old Alex, and and yeah, I think. The interesting thing for me in hearing that, I guess, at the time was he was 19, 20, and that he'd only got a guitar when he was um, 18, mm. so 6, 17, 18, because his, one of his parents is a music teacher. So I would have thought that someone who, who was kind of that precocious with guitar would have been playing for longer. So may, maybe this is a case of print the legend, you know, rather than maybe he'd had been quietly playing guitar, you know. Do you know what? And it's interesting you say that. I mean, how many, it's like the rock star age or the, the showbiz age, isn't it? It's mm. like, do, do they want that to be part of their story? So everyone quite rightly goes, oh my God, this guy, he's been playing the guitar for a year. He's never written lyrics before, and look what mm. he can do. Like, mm. how 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 does somebody do that? Is he a genius? You know, it makes people talk. But it's it? important to know that Artsy Monkeys wasn't the first band he was in. Did you know that? I didn't actually know that. So he was originally in a band. This is where the Rain Man bit comes in. <laughs> so he was in a band called Jude and Suki. So Jude and Suki, uh, in the words of John McClure, uh, also known as the Reverend, mm. who was kind of a, a childhood friend of, of Alex Turner and, and the Arctic Monkeys, and I guess to this day sort of still is, and kind of associated with them through his band, Reverend the Makers, uh, he kind of formed, he called it a, a Pugwall band. Now, Pugwall was probably a little bit before our time. It was like a 90s Australian kids show about these kids who formed a band. Ultimately, the sound, I did manage to dig out some of the demos a few years ago. It's like funky rock. It's got bongos on it. Uh, wow. Did he, he what? <laughs> so Alex, Alex played guitar in this band. He wasn't the singer. Matt Helders, the drummer in Arctic Monkeys, played bongos and it was kind You're of a, a, funk, a funk rock song I, I do remember tracking down a song called um, Ain't No it's called something like Ain't No Company or something like that Ain't No Company for the Man in the Moon <laughs> and I mean, it's like the most unarctic monkeys song you've ever heard if anyone can track that so down who, was the brain, who are the brains behind that one then? Well, it was John, John Reverend, John, John so McClough. He was, so he was he kind was of the brains the... behind Jude, Jude and Suki. Wow. Um, and then, you know, eventually the Arctic Monkeys formed um, with Alex, Matt... Uh, probably probably for the Nicholson best, and, right? Yeah, Jamie <laughs> Cook. Probably a good career move at that age. <laughs> to, to, wow, to figure that one out. Cool. So I guess, you know, the, the next portion we're going to play here is, is about their kind of early influences. And I think, you know, certainly when I first went to see them, I kind of enjoyed picking apart exactly who their influences were, but as you'll kind of hear, they're quite hard to pin down on that. You know, you, you put some into them and they'll have a contrary answer that actually, no, they're nothing like, um, they're nothing like, well, I'll, I'll let you hear for yourselves. You can hear, you can hear for yourselves exactly what they had to say on that. You know, the young stuff, as you hear them sound from a lot of these, uh, I've got to get an arm show in there, fucking Karen Carpenter and that sort of thing. <laughs> but, you know, you, there's not that many that have ever been in the past and it's long, long, long. So I guess the final um, sort of snippet of the interview we're going to play here it kind of comes back to the start of where we were talking around the early gig. So I really wanted to get a sense from them of you know, what was it like to be playing in front of these kind of increasingly feverish crowds? And I actually say, you know, your crowds are getting increasingly feverish. I don't know what's happened to the tape or whether it's the fact <laughs> that I was... Are, you sound like my, a chipmunk. <laughs> my voice is... Uh, and I haven't, I haven't referenced this yet. I mean, it's ridiculously high in this interview. I'm thinking, <laughs> at 19, had, had my voice not broken? Are my balls not dropped Rick, or something? I'm Rick Martin. Hi, I'm, how are you doing that, chipmunkies? This, this increasingly <laughs> feverish bit, I, I cringe when I listen to, you know, but... That is kind of what, was, what, what was what was happening. <laughs> so, yeah, this this is is kind of the final uh, part of the interview we're, we're going to play on on this kind of first podcast. is It's all about them really talking about the the, the feverishness, you know, the, the 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 kind of adoration they were getting at their early gigs, and whether it was kind of messing with their minds a little bit, I guess. Right, other night, not good. I like there were people falling over at drums, and they were like, <laughs> like laughing at people. I'm going to 
Well, it's good. You might want to know why it's happening. I just have a bit of it. It's like, yeah, he's just put that on. I don't, it, it, it seems like, well, if I want to know, if I knew why it was happening, then you, we start designing things. It's probably really easy for a band to get sucked up in all the craziness, though, isn't it? I mean, we 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 were both there at a time when not just this band, but multiple bands had that, and it it must have a massive impact in either a positive or a negative way on on how you become and how you start behaving as a band. And I think there could be an argument to say that this did get to their heads a little bit and kind of the way that they, they've started and they've taken their image into the kind of modern Arctic Monkeys way. Um, you know, a little bit of you just talking about him dropping the mic. Would he have done that? Would he be doing See, that I, if, he, I, if he didn't have that kind of... I slightly disagree with you here. So I, so I think when they started, you know, there wasn't, he, there wasn't a confidence to Alex and I think as the gigs kind of progressed over the months and years, that confidence came. I actually think the reason it became difficult was the way they were managed. Now, I look at this through the eyes of, of someone you know, 12, 13 years on, and I think it was a nightmare as a journalist to try and um, to try and interview this band, to try and really work your way into kind of their circle, which is often what you try and do when you're a music journalist. But in terms of band management, it was probably executed really well, and they really did close ranks um, around the band. You know, they, they, they didn't really let anyone else other than you know, their, their kind of childhood friends or people like John McClaw, who was in a band and, you know, the parents knew each other and that sort of thing kind of in. So masterstroke on their part, probably. But not even just about that. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah, that's I, I completely agree. That's probably a very good thing because you don't you don't get um, exposed to some of the other kind of rock star behaviour when, you, when you're kind of at the beginning of your career. But I'm talking about going on stage and all of a sudden from people, you know, five people in singing lyrics to you, you know, singing stuff back to you a little bit to suddenly 2,000 people going absolutely crazy at your songs, songs that you've worked hard to make. And, you know, that's got to do something for your for your ego. And mm. and I, I don't know, I, and I can't say because I don't know them, never met them, but I, I'd, have, I'd say that's probably had a massive impact. And actually probably in a good, in a positive way on their, on their art and on their music because they've, you know, if you look at the, the albums that they've done, each one gets a little bit more measured and a bit cooler <laughs> and, a, mm. and a little bit. Mm. Um, it, it's almost like that. That what what they've seen and what the the fans have given back to them has kind of formulated something new in them for them to go on to each of their new albums. I don't know. This is just me speculating. I I, I think we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. So <laughs> I think I think I think to, to to bring this back in kind of into the now we we're we're getting so far ahead. At the end of this interview, they haven't got a record deal. Yeah. So, you know, as we're going to go on to in, in side B of, of this podcast is, is kind of almost the what happened next. Yeah, fair what happened, enough. What, what happened getting, getting too excited. What happened immediately next, obviously, was they, they signed a record deal with Domino Records. Five Minutes with Arctic Monkeys was their debut EP. It wasn't eligible for chart inclusion because it didn't have a barcode, I think was the, was the reason for that. They deliberately made it ineligible for the charts, so it kind of became a, a kind of grassroots um, thing. And, yeah, from kind of here on in... Um, things went a bit crazy for the band. But I, th- I think this is probably a good place to pause uh, in terms of, of turning over to, mm-hmm. to side B. So we Definitely. have got more interview footage to play, some really interesting stuff around kind of their thoughts on impending fame um, uh, and, and, you know, some quite prophetic things, I think, without giving too much away that they, they say there. And, and some more detail on, quite aptly for this podcast, their demo tapes. So there's kind of an in-depth conversation about some of the songs have now gone on to become some of their 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 biggest hits so that's coming up next week on uh, on side b cool yes i'm i'm excited about it but um and then after that from kind of episode 3 onwards we're going to be expanding horizons to other bands um and other scenes actually to make sure you get the episode as soon as it drops why not subscribe to demo tapes on itunes and leave us a five star review So, guys, thanks for listening, and we both look forward to seeing you all next week. See you later.